Hello. Um, you've all been sitting here uh, taking everything in. You've been, you sat for this morning for three hours. Now you've uh, taken in all of these terms and um, I'm going to give you a tiny break while I have, make some thank yous. Uh, Everyone who comes to this uh, microphone uh, comes with an attitude of gratitude, and me too, me too. Thank you, Miles and Mimi. Um, uh, thank you, Morris, uh, for that talk. Thank you, Susan um, and Lorraine and Catherine. Welcome back. Uh, she's our intern in our workshop, and she was ill and has returned, and we're very, very happy to see her. So let me invite you um, to think of a now or never moment in your life. Um, I know that you've all had them. That now or never moment of, uh, say, all right, a high school moment, you're in your senior year, um, and it's now or never because you're in your senior year, or uh, you're at the end of a summer romance, it's now or never at the end there, or you're, uh, oh, uh, two months out of your last chemotherapy treatment, the brain fog is leaving and you're saying it's now or never. There are serious now or never moments and uh, less serious ones, but these are moments where there is an artificial limit coming to pressure our lives. That's why it's now or never. That's why each one of you, uh, I, I can see, uh, or at least the people I can see, are uh, thinking about those moments. And that is the source of the artificial limit of the sonnet. When you have that limit, when you sense that limit, that limit is what creates compression. The compression that's going back up the lines of the sonnet is what creates the turn, that internal churning or volta. And that is what creates proportion. So a limit creates compression, creates proportion. I'm only going to make that point in a number of different ways. And I'm going to talk about four out of the six pieces of, of, uh, of literature that are in your packet. And I'm going to ask you to, aside from thinking about that now or never moment in your life, I'm going to ask you to think about the sonnet as a handmade object. So in a minute, I'm going to kind of take you to um, the sonnet equivalent of Antiques Roadshow. And, uh, and, and in doing that, you know that when you have a handmade object, you value it. And part of the reason you value it, and sometimes the reason you value it exclusively, is because it's flawed. It is handmade. You see the joinings in it. Uh, you see the little problem hinge. All of that contributes to the sense that this is a, this is a human-made thing, and it has the patina of human hands on it. We have an idea of form that it's perfect, um, and. People who are afraid of writing sonnets have an idea that somehow or another that's some kind of perfection and that the, the, the limitation is a sort of jail. But the fact is, if you can think of a sonnet's limitations as, sim as an interior, as a skeleton that's holding something up, then you're released from that. Yet we are never released from limitations in our lives. And those extreme limitations, the extreme limitations of love, the extreme limitations of death, either others, people's deaths, or our own looming ends, create that compression, create that proportion, and 
take us along to the Antiques Roadshow of Ozymandias. Um, Ozymandias is on your, um, <laughs> it's on your, he's on your last page. So I'm gonna invite you um, uh, to uh, slip into the persona um, of a 24 to 25 year old um, velvet coated, uh, frayed collared um, Shelley. Still in love with Mary. It's Christmas, 1817. Uh, and he's got his friend there, Horace Smith, and they're uh, making a little uh, sonnet challenge together. And I'm going to show you something about his limit, his proportion, his corrections, um, and his problems. Because maybe you read this in high school. There are people who are smiling and laughing. Uh, the, uh, and as you read it, wasn't it held up to you as something perfect? I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Okay, so land and stone, he's there. Near them on the sand. Okay. Um, He's going along. Shelley's cooking along here. He's got an A rhyme. I insert a little B rhyme there. Half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown, oh, okay, we'll, we'll call that B with stone, and wrinkled lips and sneer. And of course, I think it's the sneer that we all take away from this poem of cold command. Command. Oh, okay. He's gonna he's gonna continue on, and this is going to be just uh, one of those uh, 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 Petrarchan type of sonnets that has only two rhymes in the in the first eight lines. All right. Uh, tell what its sculptor well those passions. Well, he's in trouble. He's only, he's only 24 years old. He's just trying. He's trying. He's trying. Okay, he's got to run. He's got to fix it. He has to do something here. Which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things. Land, stone, sand, frown, command, red, and things. So he's deeper into it. Um, he's lost it, and um, I'm going to invite all of you. I mean, if there is there is there anyone sitting in the balcony or in these chairs who has not had that feeling of going along down a poem and somehow losing it? And there there he is. You were witness to this. Um, uh, uh, whose passions read, which yet survives, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. Oh, great, he picked up the red line. All right, he's there, um, uh, uh, and, and he's going to add a semicolon, he's going to take a nice breath, he's going to be able to pick this up again, and on the pedestal, these words appear. And then he's going to be able to say the line um, that everyone who reads this poem remembers because it is about a name and an, and a, uh, and an extraordinary name. That is, my name is Ozymandias, king of... Oh, okay. He could grab the rhyme with things. Let's do that. King of kings. Got it. Now all, the, all he has to worry about is a peer. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. He's rescued it. And then he's able to really make his turn and say in a half line the thing that he needs to say, because one of the things that happens in a sonnet is you just don't have time to lie. You don't have time to, 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 to fritter away. You have to get to it.
And I'm going to invite each one of you to think about what that means for your own work, to put a line limit on it, to make an arbitrary decision so that you force circumstances back and have to say something. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay. Oh, well, there's a little bit more of a problem then, isn't there? He has to, he's going to have to pick up another sound. Because he's molding the rhyme scheme to what he needs to say. A sonnet isn't an exercise. It isn't a jail. Sometimes it's not even a scaffolding. It, it, it is, it's an interior of the thought that allows you, as you're making, this is a handmade <coughs> object, and we can feel him making it by hand, and stumbling. And do it as anybody, as anybody who makes any kind of craft, and that is cabinetry or embroidery or cooking, any sort of craft, you endlessly are making mistakes and compensating for it. So there he is, and here's, he's in this situation, and he's got um, up here in despair and thinking, oh, well, maybe he could make a mirror. He's got land, sand, and command up in the beginning. Maybe he could do a mirror of those three rhymes toward the end. And, and he goes for it. He goes for it. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck. And of course, the sonnet has almost been a wreck. <laughs> Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. And he makes it. Um, he makes it with decay. He makes it with a way. And um, the artifice of the rhyme scheme, part of that is that he's, he has made that up. He's crafted the scheme to go with this huge thing that he wants to talk about. He wants to talk about history. He wants to, he, he wants to leave us with this image. Um, and he also wants to compete with, to complete, compete with his friend Horace Smith who's over there writing his Ozymandias sonnet. So there's a lot of play in here, a lot of sport. Um, and, uh, and I'm just going to go back to that now or, never, now or never moment for you and notice it as Shelley hits his now or never moment where, where he says, my name is Ozymandias, but also he really hits it in the 12th line. Doesn't quite get it until the 12th line. Because there you are when you're making a sonnet. There's the 14th line down there. You're at one. You're jaunting along. You keep going. All right, this is okay. You've got your idea. It's spinning out. And then you look down there and you've got to end it. And that is the compression that's going to force you into saying something in proportion. So look and see what Edna St. Vincent Millay does with this in the 20th century. And she's on the second page with Love is Not All. In that sense of truth telling that happens in the sonnet. Uh, uh, and this, the title of this lecture is Snap a Sonnet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because you, have, you do have to do it in a snap. Maybe there are other people who can write them except in one sitting, but I don't know too many people who can do that. You just have to start and go. Um, you just have to get out on the ice and do your routine. Uh, here's the, this is a love poem uh, for all of the grown-ups here. Love is not all. It is not meat, nor drink, nor slumber, nor a roof against the rain. Okay, it's not any of those things. 
Uh, it's not going to feed you when you're hungry, only metaphorically. Nor yet a floating spar to men that sink and rise and sink and rise and sink, as Edna would have said again. <laughs> she read this poem to thousands of people. Um, she was. Uh, she read this poem after uh, uh, in, in in readings where people uh, where she filled great auditoriums and people paid a lot of money for tickets. Your grandmothers. Um, paid money for tickets to hear Edna St. Vincent Millay read this very grown-up love poem um, as her husband sat in the audience. It wasn't on about him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> love cannot fill the thickened lung with breath. Her father died of lung disease and he was, she was at his side. Nor clean the blood. Her mother was a nurse nor set the fractured bone. These are all the things that love can't do. Semicolon. Yet, many a man is making, oh well, you know, she was only a first wave feminist, so she just said many a man, <laughs> is making friends with death, even as I speak for lack of love alone. It well may be that in a difficult hour, and this is a poet who understands difficult hours. This is written in midlife. Uh, this is written uh, with an eye toward uh, World War II. Uh, the United States had not yet entered the war, but her husband was Dutch and she was very, very aware of the war in Europe. It well may be that in a difficult hour, pinned down by need and moaning for release, or nagged by want, past resolutions power, I might be driven to sell your love for peace. Just imagine, this is the person who's saying that she loves you. I could betray you, she says. There are circumstances that would make me betray you. She's got 14 lines. She's moving down the poem. She's moving very smoothly. This is somebody who's written a lot of sonnets. I might be driven to sell your love for peace or Trade the memory of this night for food. It may well be. This is, the, this is absolutely the last moment that she can turn this poem to say what she means. It may well be. She's got a half a line to do it. <laughs> I do not think I will. That is the best gift you can receive from someone who loves you. Well, I don't think I'd do it. I don't think I'd betray you. I can't say for sure. It's so much better than I'll never do it or I'll always be there. She is so qualified and yet the truth of it it is, is so apparent in the poem because of the way she's worked down the poem and because there is a limit. There's a limit and a whole enterprise is about limits. She understands her limit and she's using a form that shows those limitations. If you have never written a sonnet, would you be, uh, I don't know, could I invite you? Mike, uh, I, I'll just take a moment to thank my my workshop class. Um, 
uh, and all of you who are here and to say that we've done, uh, really, we've had quite an incredible time together. So at least you, would you, at least in my, in my class, and, and I invite everyone else, would you raise your hand if you've never written a sonnet before? Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. So there, there, I would say that 20 to 25 percent of the, of the people here have never made that attempt. So I'm just going to invite you to make a line limit. That's all. That's all. Simply saying that there is a limit will bring all of this back. You'll be shocked at the sense of proportion that will enter into your poem simply because there's an ending. Now, um, uh, I'm going to, I can't, I'm not going to get to Marilyn Nelson. I'm just going to go to Alicia Stallings, A.E. Stallings, again on the last page. Here's the argument. Uh, this is the other side of, of Malay's love poem, and here is the 20, uh, 21st century um, uh, poet uh, using the sonnet form, because since the sonnet has come into English, it has never uh, not been appropriated by poets. From century to century to century, and from Thomas Wyatt through to A.E. Stallings, Every poet, from Edward Thomas to Robert Frost, has appropriated the sonnet for their voice. And it, it really sounds like it. A Marilyn Hacker po sonnet does not sound like a Dana Joya sonnet. Uh, and uh, there's, there's, you never have to worry about it. You never have to worry about uh, losing your voice in it. You can read lots of these. You can swim in these sonnets. You can go buy the Penguin Book of the Sonnet and read them and read them and read them and have them be a lens through to literature in every century and still you'll possess your own voice as Stallings does in the argument. After the argument, all things were strange. They stood divided by their eloquence which had surprised them after so much silence. Now, there were real things to rearrange. Words betoken deeds, but they were both lightened briefly, and they were inclined to be kind, as sometimes strangers can be kind. It was as if, <coughs> out of the undergrowth, they stepped into a clearing, and the sun, machetes still in hand. So uh, there isn't a person also in this auditorium who hasn't uh, um, been in the aftermath of an argument and looked down and seen that figurative machete still in your hand. <laughs> um, something was done. But how, they did not fully realize. She knows she has 14 lines. She is proceeding from the argument in increments and in descriptions. One of the things I want to leave you with is just these three ways of approaching a poem. Shelley, who wanted to pack the whole world in, and, and breathlessly, he does, he makes it, he makes it. Edna St. Vincent Millay, who almost writes this sonnet as though she's lying <laughs> on a divan. Um, <laughs> you know, telling the truth about love, and we believe her. I mean, she is very experienced by the time she writes that poem. <laughs> and then here is, and that's about one thing, it's about one thing, but with so many different types of aspiration and possible betrayals. Example after example after example. 
you know, drowning men, blood on the lung, broken bones, all of it packed in. It's amazing how much of a world you can pack into a sonnet. 14 lines. And you can go over, you can make a heroic sonnet of 16 lines. You can, I mean, there are a lot of different kinds, and I, I, I won't tell you all about them. There are many, many places you can find that out, including about seven or eight different books right in the bookstore. Um, uh, what I want to leave you with is a sense of your own personal possibilities with this form. And so then here is Alicia Stallings writing the sonnet, maybe around the same age as Shelley was writing his, uh, but about one thing, pacing it off, which each one of you can do in your own lives, that one experience, taking that temperature line by line. Words betoken deeds. But they were both lightened briefly, and they were inclined to be kind as sometimes strangers can be kind. It was as if, out of the undergrowth, they stepped into a clearing in the sun, machetes still in hand. Something was done, but how they did not fully realize. Something was beginning. Something would stem and branch from this one moment. Something made them both look up into each other's eyes because they both were suddenly afraid. And, and she too has proceeded and proceeded this is step by step by step. <coughs> Each of these poets has rescued and rounded this poem, not at the eighth line where it turned, but in the end. And here again, after that wonderful, wonderful conjunction and, just as, as in uh, uh, the previous sonnet, there was that gorgeous, gorgeous yet. Let, the, let yet an end be our friend in the sonnet. And. There was no one now to comfort them. These two who were able to comfort one another um, after the argument, of course, uh, could not do that for one another. And it is that moment, and we've all been there too, that's another now or never moment that we can connect to the sonnet, and that you can pull in to your own poems and pull in that proportion. Even in a free verse poem, it will function for you. If you were composers and you were being, a being uh, given a commission, lucky enough to be commissioned, the first question you would have of the person commissioning you is, how long does my piece have to be? And that is the question that I invite you to ask for all of your poems. To ask at the beginning, not at the end when you've run past your ending, but at the beginning to understand how the pressure of time can work for you. I've not, I have talked about rhyme schemes, I haven't talked about meter, because I wanted to give you the essence of that snap, of that thing that you can use and you can incorporate into your own work. Thank you.